So for all parties involved, we want them to choose life. Well, we know it's a tragedy for the baby, right? It's also a tragedy for the moms and dads. And um, they that that trauma can affect their families, right? Their children. It can it can hurt them for generations. Welcome to Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman. You're about to make the jump from the dishonest mainstream media into free and independent thought from key thought leaders on the subjects of culture, causes, politics, and faith. Welcome to Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman. I am really excited today to have Jenny Landreth in the house. I'm going to give you a brief introduction and, uh, and then we'll chat. But Jenny Landreth is the Development Coordinator for Choices Pregnancy Center. Choices is a pregnancy resource center located in Chattanooga that offers unplanned pregnancy services and support, including accurate pregnancy testing and ultrasounds, among many other things, as we'll jump into today. Choices has provided nearly 61,000 no-cost appointments to women and men in Chattanooga since 1985. I had no idea you guys had been around that long. Yeah. 1985. Yeah. So it was uh, just before I was born. <laughs> Thanks for Young whippersnapper. Yeah. Uh, I was born in 1981, so not, <laughs> I was like three or four-ish. Same. Yeah. Close. So, um, yeah, we, I'm, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> but uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show today with everything that's happening in the country in terms of the Supreme Court decision and all that stuff. But I'm also really pumped about um, having you on because... There's a whole lot of conversations that I think um, are happening among people that are not in the middle of, uh, if you want to call it the fight, in the middle of the fight like like you guys are over at Choices. So um, I'm so happy to have a platform to uh, to be able to talk about this stuff with somebody who actually knows what they're talking <laughs> about. I hate to put it that way, but the reality is there's so many lies on the media and so much uh just dishonesty in terms of the way they represent things um and so uh, and i guess too we could even say this that just because of uh your biological sex all of a sudden that gives you some epistemic or some intellectual warrant mm -hmm. that that even you guys uh have so much more of because of what you do on a daily basis so i'm really really excited to have you here to discuss kind of um maybe even to dismiss some of the misconceptions about what pregnancy resource centers are, what's going on in the pro-life community, but then also too, to talk about how this stuff impacts you in the future if Roe v. Wade does end up um, being overturned. And by the way, is, we're, there's so much talk about Roe. This shows kind of the, kind of just like the disconnect. People don't even know what Casey is, and Casey is probably the more substantive uh, case law that uh, is going to be overturned by the Supreme Court. But um, I digress. But needless to say, <laughs> I'm really thankful to have you on today. So thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me to yeah. talk about all these things. Probably the most important credential that I could give you is that you are a listener to Indie Thinker. So yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a huge deal. All right. So I just want to start here because for me, um, I, I hope, this is my hope beyond hope, is that We'll go back to the day that we heard some uh, in the future. We'll go back to the day where we heard that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned. This is a big deal um, for us, potentially. And, uh, and again, I want to mention that nothing has hap happened in a substantive manner because this is still a decision that is yet to be made. This mm -hmm. was a document that was leaked for those who don't know who are listening or watching. And this is something that inevitably probably will happen but has not officially happened right now. So needless to say, um, if and when the Supreme Court decides, if Roe and Casey are overturned, I think we will go back probably in our mind in the pro-life community and think to ourselves where we were on that day. So uh, where were you when you found <laughs> out? And how did that how did that hit you? How did you feel? Well, it was, see, it was a Monday night, right? I think it was about 8.30 at night. And I really was literally sitting on my couch and just got an alert on yeah. my phone uh, from one of my news organizations and I jumped up and squealed I couldn't believe it um, because the headline that I read said overturned it didn't say you know leak yet so it, it really was kind of this moment of I can't believe this because actually Roe v Wade was 1973 but it's actually only a few months difference than my age mm -hmm. and so I'm I've always related to it that way. So I'm 49 years old, so I know it's been 49 years. I can always connect to that. So it just, it's never in my lifetime have I ever known that to not wow. be. That's so yeah, that was a huge moment. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what did you think about the the leak? I mean, kind of, because I had a couple of like concurrent thoughts. So I was rejoicing, but then I was like, 
I, I and a lot of people just rejoice, but I immediately jumped to not that this makes me some brain wizard. I imagine people unanimously did this too, uh, but I immediately jumped from rejoicing to how did this get leaked? Uh, so what were kind of the, like yeah. the the different thoughts that ran through your head when you when you heard about this? Because I'm sure. That was important to me because of what I do, but I'm sure there were other things that kind of became important to you that you thought about. Yeah, I think I'm I mostly, um, in my mind, I was thinking often about last year, you know, the summer of love and all the riots and yeah. the fear and the, the chaos that was created um, for other purposes. And yeah. so I immediately was suspicious that this leak, you know, there's other alternatives for the leak. And I, I don't know, you know, exactly what the purpose of it was, sure. but I did immediately feel like this would cause panic mm -hmm. with people um, and definitely could potentially be a really negative influence. Yeah. Um, and I think people are, are losing sight of what it's really about. They're yeah. losing sight about uh, understanding even what it is and that it's just going back to the states. Um, all of that is being covered up by a, this, you know, all the emotion. Yeah. It, did you see? You know? Did you see that they were protesting outside of the Supreme Court justices' houses? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I saw that uh, even Justice Alito had to leave mm -hmm. there in hiding, which is just heartbreaking. Yeah. I heard somebody. I think it was somebody on the View, which is just like, why would you quote them? But I heard somebody <laughs> on the View say, "I'm sorry that they had to do this," and then they gave the but, and it's like, mm -hmm. no, you're not sorry. Um, yeah, so it's wild. One of the people that were protesting, uh, I think it was a local news station that was in Chevy Chase, Maryland, that uh, was talking to some of the protesters and stuff like that. And they said, when you make decisions that we don't like, you don't get to have a Saturday in peace anymore until you do what we want. And I was just like, wow, this is this. It's it's emotional. Mm -hmm. And um, and I get it. Right. I, it's an emotional subject. Right. This is a. Um, uh, a big moment in people's lives. The closest that I ever got to it is having two kids myself, not mm -hmm. giving birth to them, but having two kids. And uh, neither one of them we were financially prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one especially I was uh, an absolute gift, but not necessarily <laughs> planned. Uh, the other one we were a little bit more ready for, but uh, but I've been in full-time ministry my whole life, and so I've never made a bunch of money, yeah. uh, contrary to what you see on TBN, folks. Uh, I, never made, I never had my own private jet. Uh, we were always struggling. And to some degree, still to to kind of make ends meet, and um, and uh, so can I can understand this is a scary thing, but but it just seems that it was intentional uh, the way this thing happened mm -hmm. uh, to gin up emotions and negative emotions so that people would quit thinking critically about what's going on uh, and start totally reacting to to what was going on, and I think we're seeing that right. Yeah, and what's heartbreaking is that it's the unborn that are the pawn here, mm -hmm. that their it, their lives are not they're being used for all these other, yeah, you know, yeah, all these other movements that their lives are being completely disregarded. Yeah, so hard. so they're being forgotten, which is mm -hmm. the most important thing. So I want to come back to that in just a moment. But then the other thing you said is that all, what's also being forgotten is that this most, so there's like this stat that's going around, right? Like 66% of people don't want Roe v. Wade overturned. But also too, the unspoken stat is that most people have no idea what Roe v. Wade is, which is totally understandable because who goes around reading Supreme mm -hmm. Court case yeah, decisions? From 50 years ago. From 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is, is that the media is very happy, it seems, um, to to allow people to think that when this decision goes down, that nobody will ever be able to have an abortion ever again. And certainly our political class is responding that way because now in the Senate they're trying to pass a universal federal mandate. This is not going to pass um, to say up to nine months you can abort your abort your baby uh, so that they can rescue abortion back. But the reality is, is all this does, it goes back to a state issue where states can then decide among the people. It's the most democratic thing on the planet, but yet it's not democratic, so we're supposed to believe, where the people within those states can vote senators in and vote for these laws and these things to so that it can actually go through a democratic process. Well, in that 66% that, you know, that they throw out there, yeah. um, a lot of these people um, ha have not had a, a really clear picture of what abortion is. Mm -hmm. And that really, oftentimes when someone then sees the reality of what abortion is, that number, you know, changes. So I don't feel like that truly reflects what people would feel if they actually knew the truth. Yeah. I think that number would be really different, but that's just my opinion. So 100%. Yeah. I, I think most of it is because the uh, 
uh, there have been a lot of forces convincing people that the good and moral thing to do is to do this. But um, I think underlying that, and I just I want to throw this out here, and I know it's a little abstract, but I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Underlying a lot of the arguments that you hear, especially on the left and especially from the pro-abortion community, just seems to be the fact that they don't actually believe or want to talk about the fact that the baby in your womb is a belly because all of the arguments about affordable child care and about um, maternity leave and all that stuff, that's all fine. And that's fine to have on a political, you know, even a state by state basis. Uh, but it, it, once you once you understand that what's in your belly is a baby, you don't get to say, um, I'm going to terminate this pregnancy because I'm not sure that I can afford child care. Because if you actually believed it was a baby in your belly, then essentially what you're saying is, is that I get to willy-nilly decide what lives and what dies based upon convenience. Um, and, I, and I hope that's fair, but all I'm simply saying is, is that underlying so much of the rhetoric with abortion is this un, maybe unintended or um, implied nonetheless uh, idea that um, that that's that that's a human being in in mm-hmm. your belly. I mean, I, I, what are kind of the thoughts that you have had running through your mind as you've heard kind of some of the things that people are talking about now on this issue? Well, it just it hearing yeah hearing those um, reporters um, you know especially on the news um, to relay back uh, what all this means. Okay, sorry, I'm like. No, it's okay. Yeah, let me back that up. Um, there is marked change when a person realizes what is actually happening. Yeah. Um, whether it's a person who's pregnant themselves or whether it's being presented with the information. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I see these um, interviews, when I see you know reporters like what you're saying on The View, it's so obvious that they don't have the truth that they're there it's a it's a distorted it's yeah. distorted verbiage it's a distorted perspective um and well, so do, do you have because uh, you brought some stuff with you so do you have statistics on that because i mean one of the things you guys do at choices is you do ultrasounds for people so mm-hmm. that they can actually see their baby and i and i don't know the numbers but i've heard the uh, that it's like astronomical there's a huge flip when people actually have an ultrasound and what they finally decide to do in terms of whether they carry their baby to term or they decide on an abortion yeah we 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 keep really clear numbers on that uh we're also connected with uh nationwide um organizations that track that nationwide so nationwide it's in the low 80s of of a person who goes in and this is moms and dads who will go into mm-hmm. an ultrasound see that baby and change their mind so it's like 80 percent of the people nationwide nationwide okay. here in our pregnancy resource center that's in the low 90s actually of those who come in with abortion being an option um, and then changing their minds to to life. So it can be, it, of course, yeah, ebbs and flows, insane. but it's in yeah. the low 90s, anywhere 91, 94%, somewhere around in there. Yeah, that's insane. So it is a huge, powerful moment. And I think that's why so many people don't have a clear um, conviction about it because they don't understand. And that's the fault of our culture for 50 years changing the verbiage dehumanizing Mm -hmm. babies um and so it's all about health care and well they would be in foster care and you don't care about kids in cages and it the focus becomes all of those issues which obviously goes back to convenience really Mm -hmm. instead of you know starting with the fact that this is a separate human being um and if you if you understood that it's against our nature to end life, yeah. you know? So I think if, if more people had that clarity, um, we wouldn't even have to have all those arguments about healthcare and, um, because that's our human nature is, is not only to, to preserve life, but especially our own, yeah, I agree our own offspring. Yeah, even in the, I think even in the abortion community, I think, I, I understand all the emotional parts of crisis pregnancies or unexpected pregnancies and all that stuff, but I but I want to believe at least, and um, I'm not a typical optimist, so you're bringing this out in me, Jenny. <laughs> uh, I want to believe that if people actually took the time to consider whether or not what's inside of you was a human being and um, maybe even took the time to actually listen to what pro-lifers are actually saying, uh, that they would not be so cavalier with with that life. We have um, to undo some of that 
yeah. brainwashing in a sense. We have to undo that for them to be able to really well, let, understand let's, it. Let's actually do that for a minute. And I don't know if you're prepared for this, um, uh, because I'm not. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but when, one of the things that we've seen a lot is uh, the coat hanger imagery. I know enough at least to be able to kind of speak to the issue. Um, but there's one of those emotional kind of symbols for the uh, abortion, uh, the abortionist or the pro-abortion uh, person is that this Roe v. Wade thing is going to make it so that people who um, are living in these states, if it does go back to a state issue, um, uh, living in a red state, maybe Mississippi, uh, and they totally uh, eliminate the chance of pregnancy. If you're a, uh, a person that doesn't have a lot of resources and funds and you're not able to go to another state that is a uh, that has abortion policies that you can partake in, well, then all that does is disenfranchise poor mothers. And what that does is it's an incentive to have illegal and deadly and unhealthy abortions. I can't tell you how many times I've heard mm -hmm. very prominent people, uh, not ever quote statistics, mind you, but come to, to this place of if this happens, we're going back to the dark ages. Women will be dying on the street because of uh, unwanted pregnancies and they'll be trying to abort babies illegally in bathroom stalls and all that kind of stuff. And so can you help set the record straight in terms of the reality of that even ever happening in the past? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of statistics. Um, there's a lot of research. Um, a lot of that goes to looking back to what was happening before mm -hmm. this was illegal. Um, so knowing how that would be now it's been you know 50 years um but what what we're pregnancy resources especially uh, pregnancy resource centers especially are trying to do is to say let's get back to the why mm -hmm. why would they go to that back alley um because they don't feel like they have the support or they yeah. don't feel like they can do this or they don't want this That's pregnancy really and they don't have options yeah. so um i could you know, I really researching some of that as far as um, what it would look like. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a lot of those numbers in my head. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as undoing that mentality of yeah, which is the most this important is what part. would happen is understanding why would someone go to a back alley yeah. if it's if it's illegal? Mm -hmm. um, and how can we address that problem? Yeah. And we can, we can address those things. 100%. Yeah. That's, that's so good. Yeah, because the desperation and the fear that a lot of people have with an unexpected pregnancy is really the issue. Um, it's it's it may not even be sometimes that people don't actually believe that's what's inside of you is is not an actual human being, but they they're scared. They don't know what to do. They're uh, they feel they have no other options, and they've been told ever since, like you just mentioned, ever since they've been alive, they've been told that this is the option is. Uh, not to really have a choice, but to just do only one thing, and that is to terminate that pregnancy until until the time comes. Now, I know you don't want to get in trouble, so I'm not going <laughs> to tell you this, but I'm just or get you to respond to this. But um, just to show how powerful these ideas are, is that I mean, just yesterday on MSNBC, somebody was saying, was Tiffany Cross was saying um, that actually, if you're pro-life, you're uh, you're you're an extremist. You're a terrorist, and you're a racist because uh, they. And she went to adoption, and she says, "Well, you can just put your baby up for adoption." And then she gave some numbers about black babies not being adopted mm -hmm. in such high numbers as white, or, or sorry, black children not being adopted in such high numbers as white children. But they conveniently left out the fact that black children are different than black babies in that there is a list to the moon and back of people waiting for a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit different when uh, we're talking about kids who are a little bit older and in the uh, uh, adoption care industry. Now, there's so much we could say about that, but the reality is, is I guess at the end of the day, is that there's some convenient facts left out and, and through all of this that we miss, especially if we're emotional. Well, I will I will throw this out there. And I... I um, a lot of times those statistics and numbers about there are this many kids in foster care that need to be adopted, we shouldn't be having more. Um, but that's really an uneducated um, evaluation of it because most of the kids in foster care are not eligible yet for adoption. Hmm. Um, and so, but, but the other side will use those numbers to say, we've got all these kids out here that don't have a home. Yeah. That don't have a family. We should. Now, is be that because they more. might be able to go back to their families? Right, the parental rights have not been um, terminated yet. Yeah. Um, but but you don't hear that number when. <laughs> yeah. 
when the, you know reporters like on MSNBC are talking about how we don't adopt black and brown babies. Yeah. Yeah, which but which is not true because babies do do get adopted. Um but but mm-hmm. children probably are in lesser numbers, but I don't know. I just I think what what is happening is that at least this is my assessment of it whether it's right or wrong. Um is that we're living in an age where there is more information accessible to us than ever before. And I and I don't think it's a lack of intelligence that we're dealing with, but it's sur- surely a lack of, of wisdom, of not wanting to sort through the evidence, um, because there's a lot of knowledge, but maybe not a lot of wisdom with what to, to do with the knowledge. And, I, and when you do that, when you dutifully step back and you really kind of think about these things and weigh through them, uh, I don't know how you can come up with some of the things that are being stated right now. Not to mention the fact that people would say you're an extremist terrorist and a and a racist just because you're trying to save babies. Not to mention, and I and I don't know if you want to get in the, into this, but not to mention the kind of dark history that Planned Parenthood has with uh, mm-hmm. black and brown babies, um, and <clears throat> and just the idea that um, one of the chief chief vectors of of the termination of life in the black community, um, it, it, I think the number one is heart disease, and then I think the second one is is abortion. If you truly believe those babies in the womb are are human beings, then boy, there there there's a disproportionate amount of black babies being aborted every mm-hmm. single year. Um, all right. So with that being said, the the good news is is that you guys are on the forefront of trying to to change all of that and are doing a fantastic job in in the process. So. Um, another argument I've heard a lot is the cra- uh, the womb to to um, grave argument that uh, you know if a Roe v. Wade gets overturned, then ultimately what's going to have to happen is that uh, you're going to have to take care of my baby. Are you ready to do that, um, <clears throat> or some version of that? And that uh, uh, that Christians especially only care about making sure that babies aren't aborted, but they don't actually care about really taking care of people. Um, so the reason, another one of the reasons I wanted to bring you in is because uh, that couldn't be further from the truth in terms of people like you. There are pregnancy resources, resource centers around this nation. Do you know how many there are, by the way? Uh, a little over 2,800 last I heard. Okay. So. 2,800 and... Um, Versus 1,800 abortion clinics. Wow. So there's more pregnancy resource centers than abortion mm-hmm. clinics. Wow, that's amazing. So 2,800 of those... Uh, not only helping people understand through ultrasounds and such that what's inside of you is, is a human being, a life, but also going way further than that. So I know you guys do so much stuff so we could spend the rest of the podcast talking <laughs> about this, but I just want to dispel as much as we can. We want to, I want to give a black eye to this myth of, of uh, womb to grave. And um, so can you tell us when, when somebody comes to the Pregnancy Resource Center and they decide that they want to keep their baby what happens and how do you guys walk alongside them from the moment that they figure out that they're pregnant and then have that baby and even beyond? Um, Well, it really starts before they get there. Um, And a lot of that is as a resource center, we're connected with lots of other services in the community. And that's a priority because when uh, when someone comes to us and they're in a position where they need support, we want to already be able to have those connections, whether they're in a domestic abuse situation, whether they need housing, whatever those needs are. If we can't provide them ourselves, we've already got established relationships. So that happens before they even come through our doors. Okay. Um, but once they do decide to um, what we call carry and parent, so they're going to carry their pregnancy and they're going to keep their baby and parent. There, uh, we have a mentor that's been through um, countless hours of training already, and that mentor is their person and meets with them uh, every other week through all the way up through the baby's first birthday. Um, that mentor is caring for them, is uh, pouring into them. They're taking parenting classes where Oops, they are um, learning um, anything. You know, a lot of them say, I don't know how to be a, a mom, I don't know how to be a dad. Um, none of us do when we first get started my but god no I, i'm they're... still working on it <laughs> yeah um but they so they have their person um that walks alongside them so it, when they're when their needs come up they're connected with connected 
people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a really important part of it. So uh, helping them learn how to be a mom, how to be a dad. Um, also healthy relationships. So conflict resolution. Uh, what does it mean to be there? All mm-hmm. those things that, that will empower them to be a, a good person a good parent. So, um, and then through all those classes, they are earning baby bucks. And then this is where uh, our community is is anything but pro-birthers. They are so pro-lifers because they, all of the the equipment, all of the baby yeah. supplies that we have are all donated. There's not anything in the budget for that. And, and I got to brag a little bit on you guys. I mean, you guys <laughs> basically have a marketplace of cribs, <laughs> baby seats, diapers, formula, all yeah. that stuff. By the way, let's just a side note here. Uh, did you hear about the formula shortage? Yes, I did. Is that affecting that... you guys at all? Uh, at this point, no, not that okay. I know of, but... Um, we often will get parents that just even will come, even if they're, they're out of our program. And if they're in need, you know, we're going to help them out and it'll turn them away. Seeing that something. That's like one so of those that's unintended a bit concerning. things. It's like there's a dire shortage of formula around the nation right now that the mm-hmm. FDA is even trying to step in and do something about. Um, and this could cost the lives of babies. But like, look at you guys on the front lines here on this, too, even kind of in an un. Uh, you know, an unexpected way to to sit there and help uh, with with mothers who have never even darkened the door of your facility to mm-hmm. help them with those situations. All right, yeah. but so so yeah, so you guys got uh, roomfuls of cribs, baby seats, and all this other yeah. stuff to help them once they and they earn kid. that mm-hmm. as they go through our program. They earn these things, and they if they participate in the program, they don't have to buy a thing for their baby. All the way from cribs and car seats down to anybody that's had a baby understands things. that is yes. huge. <laughs> Big expense. Um, And we have a track for the moms and a track for the dads. Um, So we're working with both of them. So we're very connected to them that way. We're very invested in their lives. They're not alone. We're walking with them through these things. It's it's hard uh, planning a family. It's it's really hard when you haven't had a chance to plan a family. So their whole lives have been turned upside down in a different direction. So so pregnancy resources around the country are doing this. They're not alone. Um, They can come in and say, I need a job. Well, let's let's see if we can help you with that, if we can connect them with some job training or um, and then, of course, there's the spiritual aspect to as a Christian organization where we pray with them. We are discipling them. Um, And the objective is at by that baby's first birthday, they don't need us anymore. Hmm. That's the objective. We don't want to just turn them over to someone else to take care of them. We're. Uh, teaching and empowering and supporting them. Self-sustaining. So it's very humanizing care. Yeah. Yeah. Very individual, personal, and that mentor stays with them the whole time. Now, what about in terms of like education? Like, so say there's somebody that's got a teen unexpected pregnancy or something like that. They haven't finished high school or something. And they're wondering, can I carry this baby to term and also graduate high school? Yeah. So again, this is one of those instances where we're connected with other organizations. So Young Life has a, a, a branch called Young Lives. Those are teen moms in high schools. Mm. They're getting together. They're having um, socials. They're getting mentoring. They're getting baby supplies for participating in that. So we'll connect them with that organization, and we're connected with them. If they're in college and they want to continue to go to college, then there's momentum here in town. You know, there's organizations like that. And all the resource centers in the country are connected to these other resources. And I, I'm blown away with how many people are out there ready and willing to help, mm-hmm. how many people are funding these things. Um, they're, they're plentiful. They really are, yeah. which goes completely against the, <laughs> the message that we're getting that, that if you're poor, you can't do it. And so it's better to abort. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything less humanizing than that, that if you are poor, you don't deserve to have a baby or you don't deserve to have um the joy of holding a child in your arms like that is evil um and and of course that i i speak as somebody who's done that before there's nothing there's no more magical a moment in your life than being able to sit there after nine months of waiting and wondering and then finally laying eyes on that baby Mm -hmm. being able to hold it in your arms and um and there's just there's just nothing like it it's it's a it's a miracle and to think that we uh that anyone would try to step in and create rhetoric around taking that opportunity away from people just it's 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 insane um and and then to to try to justify it um so so i i did uh, hear a guy named lucas miles who i love and i followed him uh, i follow him and listen to a lot of what he says and he 
um, said this, and, and I think he's right and wrong here, so I'm glad we just did what we just did. He said, um, if Roe is overturned, this is an amazing opportunity for uh, the church, and we need to make sure that we're ready for adoption, we're ready for uh, caring for teen moms, we're ready for X, Y, and Z. Um, and so he never got around to saying, well, we are and have been ready. And so that's the, the, the only kind of fault I would lay there. And I think that's it. That's not nitpicking. I think it's important to say that. Places like Choices are ready and have been on the front lines of doing this thing. Because I cannot tell you how many pro-choice Christians I've heard just give that line about um, uh, womb to, to grave ministry or just try to say, hey, you know, if you really care about lives, then how come you're not speaking out about immigration or just any number of things, which I think is so defeating when we're seeing since, I think it was uh, since Roe v. Wade, 60 million babies aborted. I mean, that's there is no issue that is bigger than that issue that demands our attention mm -hmm. as um, as Christians. Um, but uh, but the other part of that is is the yes, I think this is an opportunity, right? So, uh, I, do you think this is going to change things for you guys? And if so, how? Um, well, we've actually seen some of these changes happening in Texas. Yes. Um, and because we're connected with, you know, we're an affiliate of some national organizations, we're able to kind of see what 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 happened in Texas, which helps gives us an idea. Um, but when you think about a, a person facing an unplanned pregnancy, there's anxiety, there's fear, um, there's I, I don't have a lot of options here, you know, that yeah. kind of mindset. Um, and so what we have to really anticipate is that that's going to be greater. Their fear, their anxiety is going to be greater because they do feel like they have fewer options now. And so in that sense, I agree with what he said, that we really do need to be ready to kick it up a notch. Yeah. We do expect our numbers to increase if that happens, because here in Tennessee, they won't have that option here unless they go out of state and travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we, we think we're ready, um, but even pregnancy centers all around the country actually are really gearing up for this as far as uh, making sure that we're uh, getting enough volunteers and we're getting the training. And um, Do you expect you that know, it'll change things for you guys? Uh, I, we expect higher numbers. Yeah. But our numbers have been growing um, for the, actually since COVID very significantly. And so I don't, I, if anything, this will will increase it even more. Mm -hmm. But just the need for what we do is already immense yeah. um, and growing like crazy. So, so what is that? Do you, do you have any numbers with you in terms of like uh, annually what that's looking like in terms of how many people you guys see? I do. I have lots of numbers. <laughs> All right. um, even just um, year to date, we're up 14% as from last wow. year in pr the number of pregnancy tests that we do. Mm -hmm. Now, appointments all across the board were up 47% from where we were this time last year. Does that make sense? So Yeah, no, it does. That includes, you know, the family, you know, the the parenting classes, those appointments as well. It mm -hmm. also includes after abortion support, which and, and so COVID was still around at that time a little bit, you know, still in the news and stuff like that. But this is kind of like, you know, it's not twenty twenty anymore. So uh, yeah. you would expect maybe your numbers to be a little bit down, but forty seven percent is huge. Yeah, they're they there's yeah, they've gone up so much. So like our family services, the the parenting classes that we are doing from last year, it's up 128 wow. <laughs> percent. So it is the all all of our services are all growing in those ways. I mean, mm -hmm. and and we're seeing amazing results with if if someone just has one person, you know, they come in and they feel like I'm all alone. I don't have anybody. This is a huge responsibility. I can't do it. But what we're finding is if. And many who, who have aborted will look back and say, if I just had one person mm -hmm. that I thought would be there for me, I wouldn't have done that. Um, and so, and we see that yeah. every day, you know, at Choices. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think, yeah, again, just to circle back to that, it, it just throws out that whole, there, at least I know the concern, but it does um, entirely alleviate it if people look at the resources that are already available to them. Maybe even there's something subtly unsaid. Um, I'm just thinking about this now. Maybe there's like this subtle unsaid notion that if the government doesn't provide it, that it's not there, which is really just kind of a sick thought. What the, I don't want to go too far down that uh, rabbit hole because uh, I'll end up jumping out a window. But um, <laughs> but the truth is, is that uh, that you guys 
are providing so much of the things that I keep on hearing people say, well, what are we going to do about this if Roe v. Wade is overturned? And what are we going to do about this? And then I just, I just want to say Pregnancy Resource Center to every single one of those yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about like, so let's just, and I know this is, you have to be, you, you have to be as narrow as you possibly can to be as fine pointed in your scopes of service. But uh, the one thing I keep on hearing, so I'm just curious about this, is in terms of like child care. So parent uh, is single and they decide to have their baby and um, they they have to go to work and they're not sure that they can afford child care. Mm. Where does where does uh, choices step in or do they help in a situation like yeah, that? Yeah, that's a huge need. Um, actually, one of the I mean, if, if let me just take a step back, actually, yeah. from what you said, too, as far as um, our culture as far as looking to the government for to meet their needs. Right. And yeah. obviously we know the government's going to not do that but that's where so many put their hope coming to a pregnancy resource center they're given the hope of christ um and the the christian community who will take care of them mm -hmm. in a way that the government doesn't and yeah. so a lot of times that that even just that shift in who's going to help me when they actually can see there are communities there are churches here in our community that will do that yeah. um that 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 really gives them a a, a that really helps give them that shift of not thinking, well, if the government's not going to do it, I'm up a creek. Yeah. Um, so then when you when you take that down to then an example like child care, um, again, there are resources. So if they're in college, they're connected with, you know, those those organizations that help them if they have gone through some job training and they're connected to uh, so for example the maternity house um, foundation house that's in our area mm -hmm. um, they provide the child care so these moms can go out and begin working it's all just part of the program now are they an NGO a non-government organization uh, are they yes. like a non-profit yeah okay. they are yeah. are they a Christian based mm -hmm. organization yes they are mm -hmm. see this is the other thing too that we just don't want to I think mention but um or and I say we but I think like as a culture we don't we don't like to talk about um or 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 like to mention but um I I was researching a for the show that I was doing just recently researched a statistic and it said that Christians are a third more likely to adopt than any other group on the planet. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, when you look to the government and you're wondering where uh where's my stuff, um mm -hmm. you're you're only looking to like a very one-dimensional side of things. You're forgetting a whole group of people out here uh maybe conveniently that are that are doing things like that providing child, just specifically providing child care for people or Christians who are on the front lines adopting more than the mainstream and just um, just doing everything that I hear being held up as an argument right now which is just sounds like a straw man to me so it does make it mm -hmm. makes me curious as to why um, there is a convenient like uh, blind eye toward some of these things uh, because I'll, I'll just go ahead and say what I'm thinking. I, it makes me wonder if there is not a big, um, you know, lobby for the abortion industry that mm -hmm. we're just uh, not even aware of and who has to gain from this kind of stuff. Because when you see that much collusion to work towards something, it makes you wonder, especially when it doesn't make coherent and cogent sense. Well, the abortion pill, which is now um, the most common form of abortion, so they can take the pill um, at home even, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not a surgical procedure. Um, that pat in, in 2020, I believe maybe 2021 passed the mark over 50% to where that's actually the most common form. No matter who produces that abortion pill, Planned Parenthood has the patent. Mm. So it doesn't matter who, who gives it to them, who prescribes it, who, you know, produces that Planned Parenthood makes money off of, off of, every abortion pill that's wow. so i mean you talk about who's behind this and why is this such a powerful force yeah you know money 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 yeah follow the money um, is something i like mm -hmm. i know it's cliche but it's like it's never ceased to not be true yeah. that you follow the money you start to understand where uh where these these things go and so very often it goes to big pharma but i digress yeah. <laughs> um and um I, you saying that made me think about this, that there's been a lot of people who's mis misrepresented what Tennessee just did. Um, so maybe you can speak to that, too, uh, in terms of taking away, I think it was like emergency access to to that pill that was only placed there because of COVID. Do you know? Anything? I'm sure you guys know yeah, about this. Yeah, I can speak to it a little bit. The, during the emergency um, acts, 
the abortion pill was available to anyone through telehealth, which so means right. they could just go on the internet, go to um, and get it in the mail. Um, Tennessee has not provided that past the emergency act. So mm-hmm. currently you cannot do that over telehealth in Tennessee. Many states was, you can. Was that emergency act part like federal and then? I'm not sure about that. Yeah, okay. That's I don't know either. But, but needless to say, it was available via telephone. So you just call it up and you can get it. Or and internet. now. Just internet. Or, the, or internet. Mm-hmm. And uh, and now you would have to go to a doctor to get it prescribed. Is that how it would work? Correct. A doctor has to see you in person. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's super interesting. All right. So what else is kind of like on the horizon, do you think? Um, so maybe an uptick in people. Have you, have you noticed an uptick? yet or have you had people calling to kind of um ask about this uh this decision with with you guys there at the clinic not a lot at this point although when when someone is pregnant they will ask about the laws um Mm -hmm. what can we do um how how far can i wait before i can have an abortion that's you know generally what they're thinking as far as their pregnancy um typically we don't answer a lot of questions about a lot of the legal things we'll we'll send them to right to life to get those kinds of questions answered mm-hmm. um, but we are really anticipating a, a an increase in in pregnancy services especially the lab grade pregnancy tests and the ultrasounds because an ultrasound will tell them not only if the pregnancy is viable it also tells them whether it's ectopic mm-hmm. um, because that will rule out whether they could have an abortion pill, but also tell them how far along they are, which will um, give them some guidance as far as whether they have to have a surgical abortion or if they can do a medical, which is taking the pill. Yeah. So those services, because they're free and because they're needed even for those people who want an abortion, they're going to come to us to get those before they travel somewhere to get an abortion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. Just, I think it's important to note, too, for people that are listening, is that you, how does this work? I guess I should put it in the form of a question because you guys aren't officially able to, um, obviously you want to urge them toward caring and parenting, but you also have some restrictions in terms of what you are allowed to do and not to do in terms of dissuading them from getting an abortion. Because a lot of people think, oh, pregnancy resource centers, that's the extremist wing of the uh, Republican Party trying to save babies, god awful people. Um, and uh, you're you're trying to do everything you can to uh, manipulate people into mm-hmm. keeping their baby. Um, so, what wh- what are some of the restrictions in terms of that? Uh, because mm-hmm. because a lot of people don't even know this. Right. Well, I mean, abortion re- pregnancy resource centers back you know 30 years ago, they really were, and we even called them crisis pregnancy centers, which they're not anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not called that, but. Um, you know, as as we have learned through 36 years of doing this, that we actually don't have to manipulate or coerce anyone. Mm-hmm. When they see what's there, I mean, nine over 90 percent of the time, you they mean the science choose right. Yeah. They choose to keep their baby. Mm-hmm. So um, I think often some people will think back to what pregnancy centers were 20, 30 years ago when we didn't really understand as much. We've learned as we go. Um, so a lot of a lot of them had a reputation of being manipulative, uh, coercive to try to trick them into coming. Um, and that is um, the complete opposite of our, our approach now because mm-hmm. what we've realized is we don't have to do that. Yeah. I mean, not that we would want to. That It is dishonest to, to try to trick someone into it. But when we do just present the facts, I mean, I can tell you I mean even before I was on staff I was a volunteer with choices for over 25 years and um, oftentimes someone came in deciding I want an abortion and I would ask do you want to see what what that entails and just showing them a two-minute video of a doctor speaking in purely clinical terms um, so that they know what to expect um, so that they know what what this is they're walking into change your minds Oh, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, it's just that it's that obvious. So the 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 parameters really are to be completely honest with them. This is and we talk about it freely. We don't it's not a hush hush thing or oh that's a terrible thing or we get we don't gasp when they then they say they want to have an abortion or they tell us they've already had an abortion. Mm-hmm. It's just very matter of fact because when when someone really is presented with not only all of the information medically 
uh, emotionally all of the information about abortion, but they're also in an environment where they're feeling the support. You don't have to coerce them. You really don't. Yeah, and it and it just get, it comes back to this question of uh, the only the only people who seem to be not willing to actually really tell the full truth of this thing seems to be on the other side of this position, and then then you can't help but wonder wonder why. Um, but uh, but I want to end on kind of a a positive note. So I know that there's no uh, limit to the amount of stories that you guys have and the kind of uh, life changes and uh, I don't know, just kind of uh, optimistic stories that you guys have at the end of the mm-hmm. day. So maybe just what is one of the most recent stories that you've seen, experienced um, there at Choices that kind of sticks out to you? Well, a really fun one was um, a mom that came in um, and she had already decided to have an abortion. I'm not sure if she had scheduled it yet or not, but she was what we would call abortion determined. Um, wanted to have an ultrasound to see how far along she was. She didn't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, and when she saw the ultrasound, uh, there were two heartbeats. And um, oh, wow. something about her seeing that they were twins, it changed from just her finding out her pregnancy to that baby has a sibling. They're, they're siblings to each other. And that humanized them in that moment. Yeah. And just she just immediately... The abortion was completely out of the picture. Um, twins, triplets, those are all always really fun, especially when they don't know f- before they come in. But yeah. but that's a really powerful, so it's really like those babies really kind of saved each other, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, how, uh, I just think that's really cool. That is. That's really <laughs> super cool. Yeah, and it, it adds this kind of extra added like uh, element to it, not only because there's not just one decision that you're making, but it's two decisions that you're making, but also the the weird the, like dichotomy of, I'm taking this baby's like brother or sister away. Exactly. Yes, um, they have an independent relationship. You yeah. know, which which really just it just solidified it for that mom that that those were babies. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Is there anything that you think is really important to tell people before we close that uh, that you just think people should hear? Uh, maybe that has something to do with what we're talking about right now with this issue. Um, or maybe just a message that you like to share with people. So before we close, is, is there yeah. anything else you want to that you want to close with? Thank you. Yes, actually, I do. Um, having these conversations is really important that we are talking about them because for every baby that we think about saving, for every unplanned family that we want to help, there are also millions of people who have had an abortion, mm. um, and they are dealing with the wounds from that, the trauma from that. And if we continue to talk about it. It communicates to them. It's okay to talk about it. We don't don't keep that hidden, um, and that's a really important part of pregnancy resource centers all over the country too. So, I just I I love thank you Reed that you're talking about it. I think if if we all continue to have these conversations, yeah. it makes it a it makes it a topic that is is safe, yeah. and then we can really find the people that need the help. That's so beautifully put, because at the end of the day, I do care about that baby, but I also care about that mom. And and you know this better yeah. than even I do, but uh, you know what can be expected uh, from somebody who decides to have an abortion, what that mother is going to go through emotionally, how that's going to mm-hmm. tear her heart to pieces, how some people never even recover from the emotional wounds of doing things like that. Um, I know you can give story after story about that, but I really do care about the the mothers involved and the fathers involved mm-hmm. in this in this situation too. And I don't um, I don't think that that's spoken enough about it because it's it's attempted to be obscured with things like shout your abortion and I'm so glad I did this, but they they are just the rarity. the The vast majority of people are going to weigh that decision and it will be difficult and they're going to. Uh, really feel the emotional weight and the pain of making yeah. that decision, and I don't want that for anybody. Yeah. I want to, I want to, and I know you guys do too. Want to save them from that, if at all mm-hmm. possible. So for all parties involved, we want them to choose life. Well, we know it's a tragedy for the baby, right? It's also a tragedy for the moms and dads, and um, they that that trauma can affect their families, right? Their children, it can, it can hurt them for generations. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, um, they're ashamed to talk about it, but we care and there's healing, you know, and there's forgiveness, uh, and there's freedom 
from those and and yeah. how we've seen so many people who have gone through it end up you know helping and serving others which i think is the way the body was part of what god designed for us mm-hmm. to care for each other that way so having those conversations is extremely important part of that and we just want people to keep don't be afraid to just talk about it well i i thank you guys for being heroes um and for everything that you're doing right now to prep for the future and the things that you have been doing i i almost hesitated to even ask you about the question about the future because it's just like more of the same like we've been right. here we're yes. doing this yeah um so uh I, I just wish more people knew about it and that there was more of an effort to be honest about the decision that's being made and about the resources that are available to people and it's just undeniable that there's a concerted effort to make sure that none, none of that stuff gets out but it hasn't deterred you guys you're in the in there on the front lines just helping people so uh i guess i want to end this way uh tell me where people can find you how they can support you financially and maybe anything that you guys got coming up for those who are listening locally and can be involved with what you guys are doing yeah okay um our website team dot choices dot org is where people who are interested in um, in the organization to support or be involved would go to. Now, choiceschattanooga.org, those are for our patients. That website is for our patients. So okay. if they go to that, they'll, they're just going to see our services. But team.choiceschattanooga.org is where they can go to find information. And our Walk for Life is coming up. So we would love to have people involved in that. They can go to the website and find out information about it. And I would encourage actually any listener anywhere in the country, just about every pregnancy resource center has Walk for Life, um, other events like that of raising money. So wherever you are in your local area to to plug into those, um, it's just really important because we all are going to have to step up more and do more because they're going to be coming more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for what you do. Thank you for being heroes in this city and beyond for so many, so many other people. So, um, uh, and thank you for coming on today. You say thank you for me for talking about it, but, uh, but thank you guys for, for everything you do. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll catch you next time. Our thanks again to our guests for being on the show today. Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman was brought to you by our sponsors. If you like what you heard today, please do us a big favor and give it a five-star review and like it and share it with friends. And if you want to hear more awesome guests, make sure to check out past episodes. Indie Thinker is a nonprofit paid for by our sponsors and the generous gifts of people like you. In order to hear more great guests like you did today, please consider giving a tax-deductible gift by going to IndieThinker.org. And just remember, your voice matters, but infinitely more when you think for yourself.